Hello and welcome to Science Monitor, a show that brings to you the most significant news from the world of science, technology, innovation, research, discoveries and much more. I am Ashwarya Kapoor with you. Let us start the program with this week's top stories. India hosts the 24th DST CII India Italy Technology Summit with Italy to facilitate a global technology collaboration. CSIR's National Physical Laboratory, the timekeeper of India, proposes two time zones for the country. Krishi Kombu 2018 hosted in Lucknow to showcase the latest agricultural technological developments in keeping with the government's mission to double farmers' income. To prevent burning of a post-harvest waste, IIT Delhi develops a process to convert agro-waste into eco-friendly products. Our top science story this week. The 24th edition of the DST CII India-Italy Technology Summit between India and Italy was held in New Delhi on 29th and 30th of October. The summit focused on increasing technological collaborations as well as enhanced partnership in the sphere of academic and research institutions. Dr. Harshwardhan, Minister of Science and Technology, inaugurated the summit, which was jointly organized by the Confederation of Indian Industry and the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. The two-day interaction saw discussions on diverse subjects ranging from aerospace, education, communication technology and renewable energy. Science Monitor brings you this report. The field of science and technology has advanced and completely revolutionized the world around us. India too has made a niche for itself in the sphere of technological advancements and innovations. To strengthen technological partnerships between India and other nations, the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, partners with the Confederation of Indian Industries to host the Technology Summit each year. For the 24th edition, India partnered with Italy. The DST CII India Italy Technology Summit was held on the 29th and 30th of October. The event was inaugurated by Dr. Harshwardhan, Union Minister for Science and Technology, and Professor Michel Giraki, Deputy Minister, Ministry of Economic Development, Italy. The Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi, and Italy's Prime Minister, Giuseppe Conte, addressed the valedictory session of the summit on the 30th of October 2018. ये साल हमारे इसलिए इसलिए भी महत्वपूर्ण है क्योंकि ये भारत और इटली के डिप्लोमेटिक रिलेशन का सत्तरवां साल है इसी साल साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी के क्षेत्र में हमारे सहयोग को 40 वर्ष पूरे हो रहे हैं इस सुबह सुबह अवसर पर प्रधानमंत्री कांते जी की भारत यात्रा का एक अलग ही महत्व है फ्रेंड्स ये वो समय है जब टेक्नोलॉजी के बिना जीवन की कल्पना करना मुश्किल है। आज करीब करीब हर व्यक्ति का जीवन टेक्नोलॉजी से किसी न किसी रूप में जुड़ा हुआ है। पिछले कुछ वर्षों में तो टेक्नोलॉजी के क्षेत्र में बहुत तेजी से परिवर्तन हुए हैं। इसकी रफ्तार इतनी तेज है कि एक टेक्नोलॉजी का प्रभाव समाज के आखरी छोर तक पहुंचे, उसके पहले ही उससे बेहतर टेक्नोलॉजी बाजार में मौजूद हो जाती है। the aim of this event is to foster knowledge business partnerships between industries, institutions and government agencies of India and Italy. The event also helps to build greater technological transfer associations, joint ventures and R&D partnerships for better bilateral trade. The Technology Summit this year focused on aerospace, clean technology, cultural heritage, education, healthcare, information and communication technology and renewable energy. The highlight of the event was the session on cultural heritage with a focus on technologies for the preservation and restoration of cultural heritage and monuments. Italy has 54 World Heritage Sites and India has 34. The summit's unique discussion forums brought forward some significant technological solutions to safeguard the rich culture of both nations. A panel discussion on the growing field of aerospace was also held. 
India and Italy have points of similarity and complementarity that make us a national alliance in offering effective answers to the challenges of the 21st century. Italy and India are two strong democracies. We are both committed in the G20 to promote a truly effective multilateralism and an economic governance which could ensure fair and dignified living conditions to all citizens. The summit will also boost private sector investments in research and development between the two countries as well as strengthen government to government collaborations. Did you know that India's geographic expanse from the east to the west is some 2,933 kilometers? The time difference between the rising and setting sun in the east and the west of India is approximately two hours. But the entire country has one standard time called IST or Indian Standard Time based on which the entire country functions. To take advantage of the early sunrise and sunset, the CSIR's National Physical Laboratory, the custodian of Indian Standard Time, has proposed an implementable solution that puts the country in two time zones. In an exclusive interview, the director of the National Physical Laboratory, Dr. D.K. Aswal, sheds more light on this issue and its feasibility. When we get up in the morning, the first thing we do is to check the time. We do our day-to-day -day activities according to the time of a particular place. The time we follow is based on the rotation of the Earth. Our Earth spins 15 degrees on its axis, thus completing a rotation every 24 hours. The Earth is divided into 24 sections or time zones. It revolves around its elliptic orbit, which means that it revolves around the Sun in an oval-shaped path called an ellipse. This revolution also changes the position of the Earth from either being the furthest or closest to the Sun. These changes are the major factors to determine the sunrise and the sunset of a country. In India, CSIR's National Physical Laboratory or NPL is responsible for the generation and dissemination of the Indian Standard Time or IST. Currently, India observes a single time zone which is UTC plus 5.30 hours. Coordinated Universal Time or UTC is the primary time standard by which the world regulates clocks and time. Over the years, there has been a debate whether India should have two time zones as the sun rises and sets much earlier in the northeast than it does in the rest of the country. Now, a study led by Dr. D.K. Aswal, director of NPL, has studied the possibilities of implementing a second time zone for the northeastern states that will be 6.30 hours ahead of UTC. The study was published in the journal Current Science. When we have done this study, we have to consider the rotation of the Earth. As you know, that is elliptical in shape. And the Sun, the Earth also is tilted with, this, with its Earth at 25.4 degree. So it means that the sun profile falling on India's map during the summer, during the winter and the autumn and springs are different. And when we did the detailed analysis of these 10 cities, what we have found that uh, except the 6th state of the northeast and Port Blair, the 5 and half hours time is perfect as it falls this total uh, Sunday or the daylight time falls exactly within the office hours of 9 to 530. Whereas in the Port Blair and the Northeast, the sun rises much early and the sun sets much early. So the spectrum is towards the in the morning. So if you add one hour, so the spectrum becomes perfect. The time zones are measured through England's Greenwich Observatory, also known as the Universal Coordinated Time or UTC. For the study, the scientists at NPL mapped the sunrise and sunset timings across the country over a year using the existing time frame. They identified 10 border locations of India for the analysis, which include Dong, Port Blair, Alipur Dor, Gangtok, Kolkata, 
मिर्जापुर कन्याकुमारी गिलगिटुम कवराती एंड ग्वारमोटा आफ्टर स्टडिंग द सनराइज एंड सनसेट ऑफ दीज लोकेशन विद द अर्थ रोटेशन द एन पी एल कंक्लूडेड दैट एडिशनल टाइम जोन आई एस टी टू इज अ नेसेसिटी फॉर द एक्सट्रीम नॉर्थ ईस्ट रीजन वेर द सन सेट्स बाय फोर पी एम अकॉर्डिंग टू द एन पी एल स्टडी द स्टेट्स दैट कुड फॉल इन द सेकेंड टाइम जोन आर असम मेघालय नागालैंड अरुणाचल प्रदेश मणिपुर मिजोरम त्रिपुरा एंड अंडमान एंड निकोबर आईलैंड इन ऑर्डर टू क्रिएट टू टाइम जोन इन द कंट्री एन पी एल वुड नीड टू सेट अप अनदर लेबोरेटरी टू कीप अ ट्रैक ऑफ टाइम द लोकेशन ऑफ दिस न्यू लेबोरेटरी कुड बी एट एनी प्लेस इन द प्रपोज आई एस टी टू टाइम जोन टेक्निकली and as we have synchronized our clocks to the bipm clocks from npl similarly the center npl center probably at the any state in the northeast we can have similar center there we can synchronize the same clock to the bipm and make that a 6 and 1/2 plus the scientists at npl have also estimated that if two time zones are created then around 200 million kilowatt hours of electricity can be saved in the region And it's time for a short break here and when we come back we will take you to Lucknow where the Krishi Kumbh was held with the aim to double farmers income so keep watching science monitor This week a Prime Minister Narendra Modi inaugurated a Krishi Kumbh 2018 the international conference and exhibition on agriculture held in Lucknow The event showcased a number of technologies to enhance farmers' incomes. It was also a platform for farmers, technical experts and entrepreneurs to exchange ideas on enhancing agriculture production, agro food processing and high value crops. At another event held in New Delhi, the Vice President of India Venkaiah Naidu awarded the first World Agriculture Prize to renowned agricultural scientist Professor M S Swaminathan for his contributions to Indian agriculture. Science Monitor brings you a report. The Department of Agriculture under the government of Uttar Pradesh organized the Krishi Kumbh 2018 from the 26th to the 28th of October at ICAR Indian Institute of Sugarcane Research Lucknow. The event aimed at providing a common platform to farmers, technical experts and policy makers to create awareness, define the latest technologies and to showcase the business opportunities in agro processing for business houses. The agriculture extravaganza was spread in an area of over 13 hectares for showcasing the best agro practices in the country. The program extended an opportunity to stakeholders to understand the requirements of each other for investment in the agricultural sector. Over 1 lakh farmers participated in this mega event. Krishi Kumbh was organized to create awareness regarding the adoption of improved farm technologies for boosting agricultural production and farmers income. Prime Minister Narendra Modi inaugurated the event through video conferencing. Sathiyo, mujhe bataya gaya hai इस मेले में लगभग 200 सौ स्टॉल लगाए गए हैं जिनमें किसानों को नई तकनीक की जानकारी दी जा रही है कृषि से जुड़ी नई मशीनें वहां रखी गई हैं मुझे विश्वास है कि जो भी किसान यहां आएगा वो इससे लाभान्वित होगा और उत्पादन बढ़ाने के साथ साथ गुणवत्ता भी सुनिश्चित करने में भी किसानों को मदद मिलेगी विद द एडवांसमेंट ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजीज इन फूड स्टोरेज एंड प्रोसेसिंग एंड चेंजिंग पैटर्न ऑफ कंज्यूमर्स एग्रीकल्चर इज नाउ नो मोर अ स्टैंड अलोन एक्टिविटी The prospective skills of agricultural activities like horticulture, floriculture, animal husbandry are to be harnessed for doubling of farmers' income by 2022. This cannot be achieved with government initiatives alone. All the stakeholders, financial institutions, scientists, students and above all farmers have to contribute to strengthen the sector by converting farmers to agri entrepreneurs. Events like the Krishi Kumbh give an opportunity to tap the immense potential of Uttar Pradesh by making it a hub of agro businesses 
and food processing industry. In another event organized by the Indian Council of Food and Agriculture ICFA in New Delhi, renowned agricultural scientist Professor M. S. Swaminathan was awarded the first World Agricultural Prize for his immense contributions to Indian agriculture by Honorable Vice President Venkaiah Naidu. Professor Swaminathan is known for ushering the Green Revolution and laying a firm foundation for food security in the country. After harvesting rice and other crops, farmers from North and Central India burn the residual stubble to prepare their winter crops. This causes heavy air pollution across the northern plains, particularly in urban areas like the national capital region. In an attempt to find alternatives to crop burning and even provide another source of income for farmers, a team at the Indian Institute of Technology Delhi has developed a process to convert agro waste into pulp and make eco-friendly tableware products. Here is this interesting report at a time when crop burning is grabbing the headlines as pollution levels are rising in cities across North India. Air pollution poses a major threat to the health of people, particularly living in the areas around national capital region. Its sources are not just one but many. These include vehicular emission, construction sites dust, industrial smoke, firecrackers and burning of paddy stubble. The crop residue or the paddy stubble is mainly burned in the states of Punjab and Haryana, creating a record-breaking pollution in Delhi NCR during the onset of winter season. Farmers mainly burn the rice residue to prepare the field for next harvest season. Last year, NCR's air quality majorly deteriorated due to the smoke fumes originating from these areas. The agriculture residue, which is burnt mainly, consists of plant stems, straw, seed cover and husk. Each year, millions of tons of such residue is generated in India. It is estimated that around 12 million of crop residue is being burnt every year. Therefore, there is a need to take a significant step in this regard to keep a check on these pollution sources. To address this environmental issue in a productive way, Priya Labs, a startup incubated in the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, have taken a unique initiative by making value added materials like cups, plates, etc., from the agro waste. Kriya Labs was started in September 2017 with the motive to effectively use the agriculture waste materials and fibers for commercial purpose. On the other hand, the startup also aims to empower and educate farmers for generating other ways of income. The paddy straw is available in abundance, therefore, it can be utilized to make products instead of just burning it. Agro residue is essentially a lignocellulosic biomass. It consists of lignin, cellulose, hemicellulose, and uh, the science behind it is you have to extract that lignin in an energy efficient, economical, eco-friendly manner. And we, uh, the whole process we developed is a compact process which can be carried out at very small scales like two ton per day, three ton per day also. To make such products. The lab uses eco-friendly machinery processes to break down agriculture biomass into pulp. They extract the pulp from the agro waste to convert it into biodegradable products. For this, the researchers set up a small pulp production unit near the IIT Delhi campus. The raw material goes through multiple processes before the pulp is finally extracted. The steps include cutting the straw into small pieces by a fodder cutting machine after which straw is rinsed with water in a washing machine. Then it is steam cooked for over an hour to separate impurities and chemicals. Finally, the straw is put inside the beating machine where it gets converted into pulp. In the next step, the pulp is squeezed to remove excess water and is then converted into sheets or directly molded into cups and plates. The plant can process 10 to 15 kilograms of straw. 
using our process, different grades of pulp can be made from rice straw and other agro residues also. And these different grades of pulp can be used to make multiple products, for example, paper, for example, biodegradable tablewares, for example, fabrics and bioethanol also. So therefore, we are connecting rice straw to a premium market and thereby generating revenues for the smallest farmer also. And the revenue can be at least 5,000 rupees per acre and incentivizing the farmers not to burn rather than earn from it. The cellulose pulp can be a perfect raw material to make 100% biodegradable tableware as they can decompose within 60 days. Therefore, this new innovation is not just helpful in controlling air pollution but also has the potential to replace single-use plastic cutlery products. Not just this, it will serve as an advantage for farmers for making economical gain. Now farmers can convert the waste into wealth and contribute to safeguard the air which keeps us alive. It's time for a short break and when we come back, we will bring you some more news on science and innovation from India and around the world. So keep watching Science Monitor. Welcome back after the break and let's now take a quick look at some more scientific innovations and developments from India and around the world. Moths are widely considered as pests, but a recent study by scientists of Zoological Survey of India has revealed that these group of insects are pollinators to a number of flowering plants in the Himalayan ecosystem. The study was carried out in Arunachal Pradesh, Sikkim and West Bengal. The study states that different moths belonging to families of moths such as Irabidae and Sphingidae were found to contain pollen of several flowering plants including rhododendrons. NASA's Parker Solar Probe, on its route to the Sun with the aim to unravel its mysteries, is closest to the Sun than any other spacecraft ever before. It has also captured a view of Earth from about 27 million miles away. The image was captured by the Wide Field Imager for Solar Probe or WISPR instrument, the only imaging instrument on board the Parker Solar Probe. The view from the Parker Solar Probe's WISPR shows Earth, the bright sphere near the middle of the right-hand panel. Researchers at Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati, for the first time have used aloe vera gel to separate oil from water. Aloe vera has superior oil repelling property. The use of aloe vera gel based coating modified with some molecules has been found sufficient to make extremely oil repelling material. The researchers were able to separate kerosene and heavy oil from water using this new material. It can be of great use in cases of oil spills in seas and oceans. The study was published in the Journal of Materials Chemistry A. According to a recent study done by scientists at the university in Beijing, tiger population is declining and only six different subspecies of tiger exist today. The six include Bengal tiger, Amur tiger, South China tiger, Sumatran tiger, Indo-Chinese tiger and Malayan tiger. Three other tiger subspecies, the Caspian, Javan and Bali tigers have already gone extinct. According to scientists, Key threats to tiger's survival include habitat loss and poaching. The report was published in the journal Current Biology. A memorandum of understanding was exchanged between the Department of Biotechnology, Ministry of Science and Technology, Government of India and the Energy and Research Institute or TERI on 31st October 2018 for setting up India's first ever DBT Terry Centre for Integrated Production of Advanced Biofuels and Biocommodities. This is also DBT's fifth centre of excellence in bioenergy. Dr. Renu Swaroop, Secretary DBT, graced the occasion and emphasised on research and development work with creation of products in the area of biocommodities and bioenergy that can be commercialised as well. And in the history of science this week, we remember Crawford Long, an American surgeon and physicist. He was born on 1st of November 1815 in Georgia. He is famously known for the discovery of ether anesthesia in surgery. 
Long started to experiment with ether, which is a colorless liquid that causes unconsciousness. He further used it for the development of an anesthetic to decrease or remove extreme pain during surgery. Long used ether anesthesia for the first time on 30th of March in 1842 while operating a tumor from the neck of a patient. After several trials, he published his finding in the Southern Medical and Surgical Journal in 1849. In 1879 the National Eclectic Medical Association declared Long as the official discoverer of anesthesia. He passed away on 16th of June 1878. This significant discovery has played a major role in performing successful surgeries on patients across the world. Well that is all for this episode of Science Monitor you can send your feedback and suggestions to science monitor on our email id news@vigyanprasar.gov.in you can also write into us at vigyanprasar c24 kutub institutional area new delhi 110016 we'll see you again next week with another episode of science news and innovations till then goodbye and take care